us this morning. Uh, a brother in Christ and a friend of mine. We uh, I don't know, we were talking about when we met, <laughs> maybe 15 years ago or something here in the city, uh, and we've kept up connections ever since, uh, to some degree or another. Um, Scott and his wife, Sharon, and a number of other people are working with Caritas in Jubati. Caritas is a Catholic um, the organization. It's the Catholic Catholic, Catholic arm of. Catholic Church's arm of works. Right, of works. And um, we'll, we'll be learning about uh, the work of Caritas and about the, the work that you do, and also about just generally the Christian witness in Jabati and Somalia. Um, anytime we talk about Somalia, the video will be off. Um, but I'm sure we'll, we'll learn a lot of wonderful things this morning about the work that God is doing through you and our brothers and sisters in Christ in your body. So, thank you. Would yeah. Thank you, Tim. Thank yeah. you for inviting me. Thank you, uh, representative of the, of the church. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, no problem, Scott. I'm really, <laughs> I'm really delighted that we have this small, intimate group here because I am not a public speaker, and it's <laughs> much easier on me if we just chat. Mm -hmm. um, I don't like to speak in front of crowds. I can lecture sometimes, but that's not, that's kind of boring, isn't it? I mean, it's, you know, but I will kind of jump around and I would ask you to interrupt for any clarification. I've directed my friend Tim to uh, interrupt if, uh, and ask for clarifications if I kind of wander off. But um, we've been there five years now, my wife Sharon and I, and Djibouti is a little country that's peaceful in a bad neighborhood. Um, Djibouti is surrounded by Ethiopia, Eritrea. It is across the Straits of the Red Sea from Yemen. And it is just north of Somalia. So it's a little enclave about the size of Maryland with a population about the same as metropolitan Milwaukee, actually less than metropolitan Milwaukee, about 800,000, um, in, in a bad neighborhood. And the reason why we can go there as Christians, as opposed to those other places, is because it's peaceful, it's got a, uh, a government that's stable, and it's multi-ethnic. And um, our church, Eastbrook, has been involved with Somalia since before the country fell apart. We ran a um, hospital in a little town called Bulliberti, which be translates to Dust Village, by the way. Uh, about um, a day's car ride, about 60 miles from Mogadishu, and that church, that hospital stayed open until um, Western troops came in with helicopters and made our church members leave. And now that site is a vacant field. Um, but we kept uh, our heart reaching out to the lost and the poor, the refugee, the widow, the orphan, um, which is on our heart. And in fact, one of the young men who, one of the family members who uh, worked as the nurse and the office for people at that hospital, we sent to Minneapolis as outreach. They used to be missionaries to Somalia and other missionaries to Somalis in Minneapolis. Minneapolis is the second highest concentration of Somalis in the world after Mogadishu. It's about 150,000 Somalis right now. So years later, my wife and I were involved in uh, medical mission work to India. We had a long-term relationship with a ministry there, a national ministry there. We're medical people. Um, for 15 years, I'd go for one to three months, one to four months every summer. God, this is great things. I get, you know, I'm working at St. Joe's or St. Michael's or St. Mary's on the lake. And I'm a respiratory therapist. I'm running a asthma clinic. I'm working in the neonate ICU. And I'm thinking I got to stay as a temporary employee because I go to India every year for three months, you know. Well, my boss at St. Mary's said after two years there, it's like, uh, we want to hire you right, you know, permanent. I said, well, I don't think you can do that. She said, well, try me. I learned a lesson here. I said, well, I, I, I have to leave for one to three months every January. We can do that. Cool. I uh, I need this amount of money. It's kind of high because I'm like I'm high priced. We can do that. 
They're going to have to pay the agency that, that got me. We can do that. I don't want to work weekends. <laughs> Be serious. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so God opened these doors where I could get a job, get paid well, spend all of it when I went to India, have benefits, keep my seniority, and do all these things to be able to do that um, until, my, in, until my 60s. And then God really put it on our heart as we got older. We worked with fewer and fewer days in hospitals, worked more and more with the free clinics in Milwaukee, and uh, God really put it on our hearts as we, as we I'm older, I'm, you, you don't know this because you're all too young, but you become older, you become aware that your days are getting shorter and you want to you be able to, to help where God asks you to go or do. That could be Milwaukee, that could be India, that could be Djibouti, that could be anywhere, but wherever you are. And uh, our church sent a guy who had been with the original team to Djibouti because Djibouti is about 50% Somali and about 50% Afar, which is a people group in uh, that the shares with Ethiopia. The borders were drawn by colonists, have nothing to do with the nation, with the people groups, of course, and, and the locals there it kind of ignore them. Some of these go back and forth. And he could get to Djibouti, get to be, um, he's retired now, his kids are grown, get to be uh, involved with ministering to Somalis, without getting killed, which is what happens if you're in Somalia, basically, to be honest. Um, the church asked us to go and see if we would be interested in going. And uh, we said, well, actually, no, we're not interested in Africa. Our hearts in, my heart's been in India for years. My wife's heart's been in <coughs> Guatemala for years. We've gone to both. They said, well, we'll buy you a ticket. Go, take, go check it out. So we went to Djibouti, our friend, showed us around for two weeks. We got on the plane on the way back and said, wow, we prayed that God would, if he wanted us to be there, would open our hearts to these people who we didn't know much about, and that he would show us that there was work to do. And he did. So a couple months later, we went back, and that was five years ago. We showed up. We met the bishop who was, uh, we were told by Pastor Mark, who's a physician who ran the hospital years ago. Oh, say hi, to, say hi to Father Giorgio. He's a friend of mine. I knew him in Mogadishu. Turns out he's the bishop of East Africa. And they have a ministry called Caritas, which in primary work of Caritas in Djibouti City is outreach to street children. They have a clinic. They have food, feeding twice a day, schooling, clothes, shoes, washing whatever the kids need, without, because they don't have parents. Djibouti City has maybe 5,000 children there right, running around in the streets of a city of 50,000. We have 400 kids registered with us, of which we see maybe 100 at any given day. Of those 400 kids, maybe, last time I was a party to the data, we had 19 who had family members who had homes in Djibouti. And to be honest, the way their lives were, maybe half of those would be better off if they were on the street. And these are kids who walk from Somalia, walk from Eritrea, who uh, pitch on boats from Yemen. Djibouti City is uh, 60 kilometers from the Yemeni border. In our house, at times, we can hear the bombings going on in the, when the Saudis bomb Yemen. So it's that close. So there's great need, and we can minister there safely. Caritas is one of the two legal Christian missions in this 99% Muslim country. And one of our goals was to be known as a Christian. But most of the world, most of the Muslim world, looks at Christians the way from their from their own cultural eyes, the way that we the way that they look at Muslims. If you're from a Christian country and they think the United States is a Christian country, you must be a Christian. Therefore, the way Americans act is the way Christians act. Mm -hmm. So Michael Jackson was a good witness for Christian life. Sticks, the music band. I mean, you know, this, this understandably is not very appealing witness. People don't, <laughs> well, I, I want to be a Christian. Look at the way they, they live. I don't want to drink. I don't want to have six girlfriends. I don't want, I, I don't want to take drugs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We want to be known as a Christian there because we're going to get to know people on a personal level. They're going to see our lives. And God willing, it'll challenge their, their preconceived notions. And to be honest, we've been there for five years now. They're there now. We love a lot of these people. 
one of the things that we learned was that the world in, uh, in the political realm sees Muslims as the problem. And God sees them as the prize. These are millions of people, many of whom are earnestly seeking the Lord, who are sweet, honest people trying hard to do right. They know as little of the Quran as most of Americans know about the Bible, so what they know is what they've been told. And they like to. They're told that God doesn't really care, that they have to earn their way, and they can never be enough. And so their choices are to give up and just live for this life, or to try the best you can and live without hope. And that is not God's plan for us. You know, the blessing is that from the very beginning, the sin entered the world. God blessed us with salvation, the ability to have be reconciled to Him. And I love being able to go to the tea shops and chat with people. Because they say, they ask you questions, and you know, it'd be rude not to answer. And then you ask questions about their point of view, and then they ask questions about your point of view. And we have great, great conversations. So I've gone way off track, but what the heck. Um, <laughs> our, pardon? Oh, language. Language is difficult. You know, I, I learned, uh, my wife learned Spanish working at 16th Street Clinic and uh, a long time ago. And I learned Norwegian living in Norway a long time ago. <laughs> but it's <laughs> <laughs> really handy in, uh, in Africa. Um, I took French in grade school and learned to really hate it. Uh, you know, they don't pronounce half the letters. It's crazy. Um, but Somalia, Djibouti is a francophone. Official languages are French and Arabic. French because it was a, it was a French colony. It's, it celebrated its 40th anniversary of independence this year. And Arabic because it's Muslim. Most people don't speak any of those languages as their first language. The Afar speak Afar. This says food for everybody, we are one. The uh, Somalis speak Somali. Our thrust there was primarily to the Somalis, but you know, if somebody comes up to you who was born in Lebanon and has lived there all his life and wants to know about Jesus, am I going to send them away? No, that's not why we're there. It's, actually, it's great. Like Milwaukee, I was raised in a multicultural neighborhood. The people that come to our Bible studies speak Afar, speak Somali, speak French, speak Arabic. There's one American contractor who was at the base who's being discipled. There's a, a Rwandese who came during the genocide and got a job and stayed there. His French is better than anybody's in the world. He teaches French people French. He's got a beautiful language. But English is the fifth or sixth language for most people there. And you can kind of get by with young people chatting in all these languages poorly. Um, so do you use translators or? In the clinic we use interpreters, yes, yes. In public I just, I try Somali, my wife study Somali, I study the French, and we kind of, we try to get, a, we try to get along. And, you know, you're in America, and you're obviously, I'm not, I'm obviously not Somali, and I'm trying to speak Somali to people, they're usually just charmed, and they're really gracious, mm -hmm. and they don't laugh at my pronunciation. <laughs> but they do correct us, because Somalis are very strong people. Um, so, the Bible study is done in English and French, and then we have Bibles in Somali, and written in Somali, written in Afar, written in uh, English and written in French for the Bible studies. Good question, thank you. So, the bishop asked us to come and help run the clinic, which is something we have some experience with. Um, we started going there, and out of that experience, out of that um, connections and all that, my general medical uh, connections and ability to get um, equipment and supplies came into came into play. God got really prepared us for it. Because I had a ministry here, so, so collecting medical equipment and sending it overseas. We sent a container full of uh, IN stuff to Berbera, which is the country, the biggest city just south of Djibouti in Somalia, in a hospital that had been completely devastated. You know, ventilators, neonate ICU stuff, the whole shooting match. Um, so our, our ministry there now has three basic thrusts. We work with Caritas. We don't stamp the clinic as much as we used to. We do more like fundraising, finding, getting uh, medication sent in, 
getting uh, equipment sent in, finding people to staff it. So you know, if you know anybody who's a nurse practitioner or a physician who wants to come to a very hot country for a little while, um, we'd be happy to help them out. We're not doctors, so it would be nice to have a physician there in order to um, not have to refer the kids to the local hospitals as often as, as often. This is supposed to be slow. I'm just going to run this in the back in the uh, behind me and kind of chat off of it. And if something gets your eye, please speak up. So Caritas is our primary thrust while we're on the ground there. Um, we can't run an orphanage. We have to get government permission to do that. And it's a Muslim country. They don't want the kids sleeping there, staying there. We can't take them in and let them sleep because they're illegal. And the police would just come and round them all up and take them out of the country. So we give them what we can. Sometimes out of our poverty, sometimes out of our money. This is at the refugee camp. This is a group of folks that got Milwaukee County, Milwaukee County Zoo shirts. There were major fires in the uh, suburbs <coughs> caused by gas leaks and people uh, tapping electricity off the line. The goats do find a way to eat in this country, which has two average two <laughs> inches of rainfall per year. <laughs> it's the hottest place in the world. Average temperature where people live. There are Somali believers. This is the Lord's Prayer in Somali, uh, one of our worship books. God is moving. There are many people who are curious, who want to know who God has worked on their hearts. People, a lot of Muslims have dreams, and they, they dream about praying in a church or talking to, a, talking to Jesus, and we're there to answer their questions. <laughs> Again, there's a fireman working at the fire there. We probably about 10,000 houses burned down in that, in that little area there. So this was uh, just this last summer. Um, it gets down to 80 degrees in the middle of the night in the wintertime there. If God makes it possible for us to be there. I'm genetically Swedish. My wife is genetically Finnish. We got married on January 20, on January 31st and went north for our honeymoon. <laughs> and you get the trend here. <laughs> but through your prayers, God lets us stay there. This young man needs, needs surgery or correction of his club feet. Oh. One of the things I'm able to do is make connections with hospitals out of the country to be able to correct that. And we have to raise the funds for that. Um, those are kids in the, in the neighborhood just uh, hanging out. That's after a one inch of rain that happened in March. It took about a week for that water to go down because the ground is concrete hard. That's me filling uh, prescriptions at a, a woman who's got uh, two kids. Is she homeless? They're all homeless. Yeah, we only minister to the homeless, the poorest of the poor. Um, the crows and the goats, goats are everywhere. Uh -huh. they're, they're a herding society, but this is kind of a fun picture. These are some of the Caritas kids playing with toys and magic markers. Uh, we were trying to get the magic markers out of their hands. <laughs> but it wears off. <laughs> That's the crew a couple of years ago, 90, 90 all of them volunteers from various parts of Africa and then some other Teresa's order. Yeah. This is our uh, interpreter. That's a yeah, very unusual girl. She came, uh, walked in. She's an English major at the, high, at, the uh, at the university. And she wanted to know how she could help. She wants to work with refugees. She has a very soft heart. So, so uh, she was a, quite a blessing. She was just in love with my, with my wife. Um, this is one of the uh, guys who's got diabetes. He's got a non-healing wound. And uh, Sharon shares them up. Thank you. Uh, this is a boy that's a, a Scottish physiotherapist that comes every year. We try to schedule her to see all the, the uh, CP kids, the cerebral palsy kids. That's a little boy whose mom is really happy because he's getting his first wheelchair and he's getting kind of heavy to carry around. He's also getting his first toy. Caritas out in the country has a, a, residence, a resident school for the handicapped. It's the only one in the country. And they also do training for the local women there to uh, learn to sew. Uh, we got equipment from Sandpoint, Idaho, got donated here. And I wanted to take pictures of it and uh, let them know that we uh, got it. And it's a gift. Uh, God has provided us with a, a ministry that will send a container to us at, without charge. Mm -hmm. And so I'm able to get good stuff. This is stuff that just God just provided. This is the same boy with his uh, t-shirt and his smiling mom because her back is going to feel better. Uh, this is one of our girls. She's grown up with us. She's become a glue sniffing 
addict, her brain is beginning to rot, and that's her second child, she's 15 years. Mm -hmm. This man is getting a new wheelchair, his old one's pretty ratty. There are no, no, up until this year, there were no, there was no way to get a prosthesis. You had to go to Ethiopia and had to get about 2,000 bucks. I mean, they, most people would earn about a buck and a half a day there. Um, so that man, excuse me, that man with the wheelchair, where does he actually live? Because you're not allowed to let them live in your facility, right? Correct? He lives in one of the, in, uh, probably with family, in one of the, the shanty in the neighborhood. Okay. It's a pretty, pretty rough place to be. Handicapped. I'll show you a picture of a handicapped guy in one of the streets. This kid is the same one that had the semi-permanent marker on his face. He just wants to help. You know, sweet kid. I did sweep after he was done, but you know how kids are. <laughs> Men to donate it. I'm sorting them out to give them to uh, a doctor out in the boonies who uh, ministers to the poor, to uh, give to an eye doctor that ministers to the poor that we refer patients to. And uh, this is our Christmas stick. This is this is, uh, <laughs> this is Christmas at our house. <laughs> Scott, how much of the homelessness is, is socioeconomic, and how much is just an influx of refugee kind um, of <clears throat> populations that, for for lack of mobility, have just ended up staying. Um, it like like most of the third world, the city is a magnet for people from the bush. <laughs> who think they can get a better life there. And what happens is that they get to the city like Mumbai or Calcutta or Djibouti or Nairobi, and not only are they poor, they're also without their social resources that they had in their hometown. We do send people back when we can. It's about 50-50. Okay. Um, we had a 13-year-old who uh, was learning English. We used him as an interpreter. He walked from Somalia when he was seven. He walked from Somalia because El Shabaab came into his town, oh, yeah. and they gave him the option of taking a gun and shooting people, or they would shoot him. And he said, I didn't like either option. So, no, it, that, that, that either option, so I walked here. Walked across the desert, alone, seven years old, without water, without food, without money. And God brought him to Caritas. Um, when it does rain, it's kind of a mess. This is the main highway to the second largest city. <coughs> This is a birthday party for one of the nuns, and this is our new kitchen area, and we have an Ethiopian chef who takes little bits of money and makes great food for these kids. Um, one of the things that we do is we have a, we had a conference, and answer to prayer, a conference brought in this Italian a physiotherapist and orthopedist to be able to, sh to teach locals how to evaluate their handicapped children. There's no handicapped children in school. And these sweet women are teachers from the schools, and they put God put the handicapped women on their heart, kids on their heart, and they came to learn how to evaluate. And it was an answer to prayer. It was a three-day conference where we um, um, where we taught them how to how to think about the kids as complete human beings instead of cursing to God, which is what they think. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my ministers, I'm an asthma educator, so I have a number of children with asthma who see me in our home, and I can get medications there through the, uh, my connections here. This little guy was going to the ER for care for one uh, every other week since he was he's seven, he's three years old. We had a lot of steroids in the system. We were able to get him stabilized. It's a very dusty, very hot, very dirty country with lots of- with all that smoke. Lots of smoke, lots of diesel. Yeah, it's pretty bad. These are some of our girls waiting for, uh, I think this is a Christmas Eve, um, waiting for the, for the meal. That's I mean, uh, my 15-year-old truck unloading food that we got donated, the guy in the, Back is getting really hot. Oh, that's me. <laughs> Sharon was a refugee woman. She came from Saudi Arabia after her husband died with uh, seven kids. lived on the street. Um, she was working, and you know, your life isn't your life isn't going the way you like when it looks better to go to Somalia than, than where you are. This little boy probably has an absorption malabsorption issue, and he probably isn't alive anymore. We couldn't find help for him. Help for him. This is working in the clinic with the air conditioning working. <laughs> it's so hot there, we can say matches, the candles melt without being lit. <laughs> it took seven days for that <laughs> the candle to go completely inverted in our, on our dining room table. <laughs> this, is doctor, uh, this, is a, this is a doctor who uh, works uh, in the South, who I'll talk about later. Great man. Uh, Koreans came uh, off of a, their only destroyer. They came to visit. They walked up to Kirita. I said, how can we, the uh, captain is a believer. He came in. He said, how can we help? And he said, you got any doctors? Yes. 
can they do physicals on all our kids? He says, I got four days. I said, we will make it happen. So we got baseline physicals for all the kids with these hard working servants of the Lord. And that's uh, our good interpreter, Muhammad. And we're measuring the kids' height, and we've got a medical record for them now. And uh, that suit is plastic. I must really love these kids, because. <laughs> <laughs> but I get to play. I get to play Fair Noel because I got the white beard. But then my wife also gets in. <laughs> <laughs> um, Obak is a, on the map is a, a is a town that's closest to uh, to uh, Yemen. And this, this servant of the Lord came to uh, work. She's not a medical person. We gave her a copy of where there is no doctor, some training, and a bunch of basic medications that she could reach out to the refugees who were there. This is a drawing of a Yemeni kid who's drawing about what his home is like, airplanes, bombs, blood. Um, she's been teaching them in classes, and they got some better better drawings now. But it's a rough life. This is kids in the, uh, the new Obak refugee camp. Look, that's really how Djibouti looks. That, that's it. Uh, there are traffic problems in town. <laughs> um, oh boy, shoes! A number of churches in the in Milwaukee got uh, went to Kmart and dollar stores and, and sent us uh, 350 pairs of flip flops so we can get these kids so we have, we're able to treat fewer foot wounds. Um, again, container full of stuff. Our physiotherapist noticed the packer room. Uh, bumper sticker on the truck. Oh my gosh. <laughs> this woman, uh, this little boy had a hypercephalus or a, a meningocele that, that's part of her brain. It's a one-year-old coming out through just the meninges. We were able to get her to uh, Argesa. This is her at, at a year later. And uh, mother comes every year so she can show off Hodo, her baby. This is Hodo again at the clinic with our, some, with our smiling mom. <laughs> This is Hodo this year. She's beginning to walk. Um, we just, I just like to brag on her because she's just a great little girl. Um, this is a typical uh, um, nomad's homestead. And uh, you, the way you feed the goats is you, when they're little, you throw them up in the trees and they learn that there's food up there. So when they get down, they figure, they figure out how to get back up. Um, camels are actually owned by somebody. This is another boy, he's more flip floppy, um, poor muscle tone, so we got him a specially adjusted chair. And, uh, this is the uh, compound, the clinic, the kids are coming out of the clinic by the red, the red door there. Um, this is the new Rimava clinic, this is another physiotherapist came from Milwaukee, is evaluating this woman's contracture from a stroke she had at the age of four. And uh, she's doing an evaluation of a, uh, a cerebral palsy child in the home of the family. And uh, this is what we do in Milwaukee. Uh, <laughs> wrap up stuff and put it on the container when we're back here in, in uh, the fall. And that's, that's that. <coughs> Questions? So who's running the show when you're not there? Uh, we have a French doctor who comes and she takes over the administrative duties. And uh, we have, uh, uh, there's a whole uh, series of uh, mostly French women who come to volunteer and take care of, uh, of um, the kids, along with uh, expats, wives, primarily. Um, uh, now you can cut it for a second. Okay. Primarily, um, it, it, key stuff is going on there. And it's, it's a joy to be there. But it's really hard. It's, it's you know, very hot. It's expensive as Milwaukee. Um, electricity is 60 cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, we don't run the air conditioning very much. Um, so talk a little about the water, because they, I noticed that they they must have to irrigate their, their gardens and things, and where does that all come from in such a climate? In the south, they can use the pumps with the, with the, with the, uh, with, with the uh, wells. In Djibouti, everything is imported, including the water. Raised two inches a, a year there. The groundwater comes out at about half strength saline, about uh, half a percent um, salt. Um, you have to buy it. It's trucked in from, from Ethiopia. Absolutely, absolutely nothing grows there. A tomato is about a, as nice as a January tomato here, and uh, it's, it's about a buck. Uh, so everything is, uh, is, is imported. 
Uh, Djibouti is run as a business. It has the it has the port. It has the economy of uh, Ethiopia and northern Somalia and southern Sudan in its pocket because it has the only port that they can get to. So it lives off of off of uh, trade. Unemployment is near 80 percent for youth in that country. General unemployment is about 60 percent, but because it's a clan-based society, one person or two people in a in a in a family have a job, everybody can eat. Rice and pasta and baguettes, which are really good by the way, are, are, are subsidized by the government so people don't starve. But there's a lot of hypertension because of the salt in the water, and there's a lot of diabetes because of, it just, it's a pretty high carb diet. <laughs> you know? um, and so it causes a lot of medical problems. The, the Pray for the Youth, they, they have a youth, Djibouti, when it was independent, the French left a, a the French were not like the British. They did not help the people that they left. There was one high school graduate, no high school, two physicians in the country, no college. Djibouti has a functioning university. It's not Marquette, but it's a functioning university. They have public schools that are universal. They have a school system. They have a healthcare system that is not St. Luke's, but it's much better than nothing. And they have lived together, two people groups in Africa, without violence for 40 years. And there are a lot of problems, but this is to be celebrated. This is God protecting this country, I think. Um, so, but you have youth, 80% unemployment, educated now, been told at the university they'll be able to get a job, they can't. You have, you have uh, radical Muslims coming in, telling kids, see that Prado, see that, that Highlander, see that Land Rover, it's yours. They stole it from you. It's not a good mix potential for a real time bomb. When the current president dies, all bits are off as to what may happen. He's on his fourth term of his constitutionally limited two-term presidency. <laughs> uh, um, do, do the people that you treat, um, the, the most impoverished, do they have a sense of, of hope uh, for themselves and their future? And you know, even the sense of, I got to be careful how I say this so that it's understood, you know, political rights, you know, human rights, and then just like. Rights are not part of the reality of the people on the street. Mm. What, what we can give them and what we have been told many times is that by loving them and treating them with respect, and they see us as someone important, as the first time someone with education, with status, has treated them with respect, it blesses them. And we have seen some of the street ladies blossom, some of the street men blossom. And what they want to do is they want to help. So we, we never turn them away. If you got the guy with the bad foot, he wants to work on the on the fence, please. And he's not, not trying to ingratiate himself to get a job. He just wants to love us back. And that is a major a, a major gift, I think. It is we don't share the gospel with the kids. They know we're Christians, they know it's a Christian ministry. But I think just keeping them alive is a worthwhile effort. <laughs> they can't learn the gospel when they're adults if they're dead. And we get to be, and we, we get, they just, I don't know, it, it's just mostly sweet, but also bittersweet. They have a very hard life. So we see about 80 kids in the clinic every day. About half of those are foot wounds, because it's, it's a rocky, dry country, <coughs> and it shoots. And then the normal so kids, those flip -flops, they last know. about three months. And sometimes they give them away, they, they'll, they'll swap them for food on the street, you know, or they run out of them when the police go after them. And the police, the unenlightened police treat them like they're criminals, the enlightened cops bring them to us because they've figured out that the kids that come to Caritas are less trouble on the street. Is there much um, child? Yeah, I believe there's a lot of, I believe that there's, I, I call it slavery. I think human trafficking is a yeah. euphemism. We have 85% boys. I don't know where the girls are. I'm afraid I do, but we mm -hmm. can't seem to get a, a handle on it. Um, Obuk was a center for child trafficking <laughs> before the war in Yemen. So maybe it's a plus, because they would send girls to Saudi Arabia, which is an evil mm -hmm. thing. Um, yeah. It's a good segue and reminder. Um, 
<clears throat> next week, Lutheran Social Services will be with us. Great. Talk about right. human trafficking and uh, refugee resettlement, but also just some of the wider things. So it seems to be a, it's yet another set of narratives and stories to have in our minds as we as we continue to kind of explore uh, this over the next few weeks. And so. bringing the nations here, the South Side is full of Muslims whose lives have been destroyed and they are asking to be loved. And we can all do that. The South Side of Milwaukee. South Side of Milwaukee, yeah. yeah. I, uh, there probably a dozen other things I should have talked about, but I don't remember them, so what the heck. Scott, in terms of supporting your ministry, um, if people want to do so financially, they can send money to Eastbrook Church, is that correct? Right, I'll, I'll give you a handout if, if you okay. want to support any of the three groups I talked about. You could, uh, if you want to send money to Caritas, or support us, or support um, my wife and I, us, or you can support Caritas directly. Caritas for Children in Milwaukee will take funds for that to get a tax deduction. Anything to us through, uh, um, you can turn that off now. Um, from uh, who, uh, is looking out for each and every one of us, and uh, yeah. and through uh, Scott and his brothers and sisters in Christ and in uh, Djibouti and Somalia, God is doing great things, great things even before they show up. But uh, Heavenly Father, thank you for the work that uh, those who bear the name of your Son Jesus Christ are doing. And thank you for the work that, the miracles that you're, you're doing, uh, the, the visions and, and the hope and people have, who have never even had a Bible in their hand or, and have only the vaguest idea about Jesus. Um, uh, may, may there be an increased uh, life of, of grace in, in Jubati and Somalia and uh, in the war that, in the, mm -hmm and the violence that uh, besets uh, the region uh, come to an end. Uh, whatever happens, uh, we pray your continued blessings on your servants. And uh, we pray a special prayer for Scott and Sharon uh, for their safe return. Uh, may they flourish in your grace, by your grace, for your grace. In the name of our blessed Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our email address is on the prayer cards, and if you'd like to get on our supposedly monthly, but much less than that, newsletter, um, <laughs> we'll be happy to include you. And I, I just, we want people to pray. It really doesn't happen if, if people don't pray. Like I said, uh, the lubricants for the, the, the fuel of, of ministry is. <laughs> Prayer, coffee, and money in that order. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for letting me monopolize your time. Um, Just bless us.